This is CBS 19 News at 10. Thanks for watching CBS 19 News at 10. I'm Brian Bose. And I'm Nina Harrelson. Well, tonight we are continuing our search for answers in the case of missing Kilgore woman Shariah Grant. It has now been more than a month since the pregnant 20-year-old was last seen. Her due date has since come and gone, but there's still no sign of her and few leads to go on. But Grant's family says more needs to be done to find her. Our Tristan Hardy has the story. Shiera Grant used to stop by to get some food and to see her sister Shariah at the Chicken Express where she worked. Now the restaurant has her missing signs taped to the windows, along with a message for people who pass by. What's left of Shariah's things were destroyed when their house mysteriously caught on fire after her disappearance. Now, a month has passed, and her sister says she can't help but feel lost. My family, every day, every night, we ain't forgot about her, and I, I don't want nobody to forget about my sister as well. You know, she's still missing. It's been a while since Grant stepped foot in front of her home. Everything destroyed in that fire. She took me on a tour of what remains there. The floor was too dangerous to walk on, but Shariah's room was the first place you'd see when you went inside. We lost everything. Started with Shariah, and then we lost the house. When you see this house like it is, I mean, how does that make you feel? Empty. But even though it's been more than a month, and the pregnant 20-year-old's due date has already passed, investigators say they're confident Grant will be found. And Shiera believes police are doing what they can, but she says the family needs everyone's help to bring her and her baby girl home. The community should be more involved, you know, spreading the word and, you know, I mean, anything that they hear that's positive, you know, or, you know, that'll help the situation. She admits staying hopeful grows more difficult the longer her sister and niece are missing. So many questions still unanswered. We want to know where she's at and what exactly happened and why it happened. For now, her family is still waiting patiently to know where Shariah and baby Ayana Grant are. When the time is right, the truth will come out. And what happens in the dark comes to the light. Now, Shariah Grant has been missing since August 20th. There is still a $5,000 reward for information leading to her. Greg County Crime Stoppers tell us the longer she is missing, of course, the harder it becomes to solve that case. Now to a CBS 19 exclusive, a terrifying home invasion in broad daylight. A Tyler woman says burglars broke into her home, taking off the TV, jewelry, and other valuables while her sister hid. CBS 19's Brett Vetter live tonight on Winona Street where it all happened. And Brett, she says their home wasn't the only one hit. That's right. Ruth Estrella says several of her neighbors have also been targeted. She says she was out grocery shopping with her kids on Saturday when she received a frantic text from her sister saying that there were people in the house and to call 911. I, I couldn't imagine what she was feeling. Um, she wasn't safe. A sense of panic she says she will never forget. And she kept quiet until she started um, hearing them like push against the door. After her sister's text that someone was in their home, Estrella and her children rushed back, not knowing what they might find. Everything was gone. Our TV was gone, our jewelry. We had a cash. Um, they just took what they could, I guess. Thankfully, her sister wasn't hurt, and the burglars took off before police got there. A scene Ruth says is all too common on her block. It has happened to our neighbors. Like, they have um, a lot of things that aren't right going on around the neighborhood. Moving here six months ago from California, Estrella says the break-in has shaken her family to its core, scaring her sister so much she moved out the very next day. And while Estrella says Tyler police were helpful, she feels more could be done to keep the people who live there safe. I don't see anything being done about it, and we never saw this coming. Like towards us and especially during the daylight, but I guess things are getting worse. Now reaching out to Tyler Police today for more information and to see if there's a public safety concern here. They tell me that they're looking into the situation and they get back with me tomorrow. We'll of course continue to follow the story and bring you the latest information when we get it. Reporting in Tyler, Brett Vetter, CBS 19. Thank you, Brett. New tonight, an NSA contractor, a Navy veteran in jail accused of stealing government secrets. Prosecutors say Harold Martin III admitted to stealing top secret computer codes. He was an employee with Booz Allen Hamilton, the same place where Edward Snowden worked. 
Now, law enforcement sources say this all began in August when someone posted highly sensitive secrets about the agency's cyber tools online. Neighbors say they had no idea what was going on when federal agents raided Martin's house. Well, today was the third day in the trial for a Georgia father charged with murder, accused of leaving his little boy to die in a hot car. A witness testified today that Justin Ross Harris showed grief after his toddler was found dead two years ago, but she didn't think his tears were sincere. Atika Eastland said Harris's tears were, quote, on and off. Screaming, pacing back and forth in front of his car. What have I done? What have I done? I've killed my son. What have I done? What have I done? Eastland said Harris's calm demeanor was unusual, but Harris's lawyer argues the witness doesn't know his client well enough to know his mannerisms. 22-month-old Cooper was left in that SUV for seven hours outside his father's workplace. He maintains it was an accident. Developing now, disturbing new data from the Department of Family and Protective Services shows that in more than 40% of child abuse cases from September in Travis County, CPS workers didn't visit within their deadlines. Christy Millward with our sister station in Austin shows us what this means for kids in Central Texas. In September of this year, the Department of Family and Protective Services in Central Texas got almost 15,000 reports of child abuse or neglect. They divide those into two priorities. For a more urgent call, priority one, caseworkers should respond within 24 hours. In priority two, within 72 hours. But that's the deadline many caseworkers are missing. Data from DFPS shows in March of this year, statewide CPS caseworkers didn't see 30% of the cases in a timely manner and 31% in September. In just Travis County in March, caseworkers didn't get to 32% of the cases in time and missed that time mark 42% of the time by September. Stacy Bruce, the executive director of the Austin Children's Shelter, says that's surprising. We know that the caseworkers have big hearts and a passion for this work. However, they are limited by the system. But she says time is of the essence. We have to get there quickly. A spokesman for DFPS tells me the key is more workers in the field, but acknowledges a high turnover rate. He says they're asking lawmakers for 510 more investigative workers in next year's budget. Bruce sees this as an opportunity for the community to come together for change. We see other local nonprofits and foundations also stepping up, coming to the table and saying, how can we as a community come together to protect these children? The DFPS spokesman also says a lot of times CPS workers attempt to contact families but can't find them. That's one big reason lawmakers passed Colton's law last session in honor of Colton Turner. It requires CPS to notify law enforcement if they can't find a child after reports of abuse. Well, for many men, a wedding ring is right up there with a house and car on the list of biggest life investments. You got that right, sister. So when one goes <laughs> missing, it can be devastating. But can you imagine the relief of finding it again? Meet the woman who could finally relax after a tense year. Next on your News at 10. And State Fair of Texas Secrets revealed. Don't assume you've seen and done everything in Dallas until you watch this story. You're two and a half minutes away. Don't go anywhere. You don't even have to be a true Texan to know about big tax and all the fried food at the State Fair of Texas. But reporter Brian New shows us the top five things even annual fairgoers may not know about the State Fair. This is a schedule of events. Gotcha. You would be hard pressed to find anyone that knows more about the Texas State Fair. Oh, trust me, I do know. Than Carol Burke. The skillet is right here, just inside the Midway Arch. While Big Tex may be the fair's ambassador, Carol is the guide. Along with her husband, Ted, the two have been pointing people in the right direction for the past 40 years. Some of them are, quite frankly, are overwhelmed because there's so much to do, so many places to go. And so much to eat. Really? Yeah. <laughs> do we have food? <laughs> All right, enough with the obvious. So with the help of these two, here's our top five things you may not know about the State Fair. Number one, fried pickles, fried cheese sticks. And check this out, deep fried bacon wrap hot dogs. What could be more State Fair than that? Greek salad? Yes, contrary to popular belief, there's actually healthy food that you can buy here at the fair, from salads to fresh fruit. In fact, you can even get a vegetarian corny dog. Number two. 
The state fair is about more than just rides and games. This year, a replica of the Sistine Chapel is making its U.S. debut here at the Texas State Fair. This was supposed to go on display at the U.S. Catholic Museum, but the State Fair of Texas was able to first bring it here to the Lone Star State. Number three. With the Texas OU game, this Saturday will be the busiest day for the fair. But if you want to avoid the hectic crowds, try coming on Wednesdays. Historically, they're the least busiest days of the week. Plus, Wednesdays are the cheapest days. With a four can donation to the food bank, admission is just four bucks. Number four. Here's another way you can save money here at the fair. Instead of spending all your coupons on food, you can bring your own food, and that way you can save your coupons for the rides. Number five. Last year, 630,000 of these corny dogs were sold at the fair. But when it comes to the number of people who attended the fair last year, no one knows. I'll let you in on a little secret. It's because no one counts. The state fair claims that three and a half million people attended the fair last year. But according to one study, that number was probably closer to a million and a half. But honestly, who has time to count, especially with so much to do? And if you make it out to the State Fair, we want to see your pictures. You can post them on Facebook or Twitter with the hashtag ShareTheFair, and you just might see them on TV. Now to an uplifting story out of Central Texas, where a woman has been reunited with her lost wedding ring after more than a year. Sonia James Stewart was shopping at this bill store last September before going to get her wedding ring resized when it slipped off and landed under a clothing display. A custodian later found it and turned it over to the manager who waited for Sonia to come back for it. Well, that finally happened this week when Sonia went back to that same store and the manager recognized her. I just instantly just started shaking. My hands started shaking. I started crying and I just fell to my knees and said, thank you. Thank you, God. And there are angels everywhere in here. And she was like, I remembered we've had the ring, but I haven't saw you. <laughs> she says it's inspiring to see that those two women, the custodian and the store manager, cared enough to take care of a ring and make sure it got back onto the hand of its rightful owner. There are still some honest people in this world. That's I can't nice believe it took to her see. a year to go back I know, to find to her ring. Back to that store, but I'd she have been got back it. back there every day for like uh, six months. She got months, it though, yeah. yeah. She probably thought somebody took it by then. Well, coming up next, the latest on Hurricane Matthew. Dozens have been killed in the Caribbean, and now it's heading towards Florida, where residents have just 24 hours to pack up their lives and get out. We'll share the governor's strong words for anyone who's considering waiting out the storm. And we'll check in with Alberto for a look at what's going on here at home when CBS 19 News at 10 returns. Hey, hey, hump day is just about over. Looking at Tyler, our Weather Authority Tower Cam roads are dry. Looking south on Broadway, 79 degrees. Humidity on the rise. It feels like it's 82. Winds uh, very light and variable across East Texas, and unfortunately, no rainfall. But we are seeing those drought conditions slowly but surely returning. Here's what our temperatures look like right now. As of 10 15, um, mid to upper 70s for most. Still holding on to 80 degrees at Tyler Pound, 78, Jacksonville, 79, Palestine, and mid 80s currently for the DFW area. But as far as officially for today at the airport, we hit 91 degrees for our high. 10 above our average where we should be for our high and just six degrees shy of our uh, record back in 1909 of 97 degrees and that rain deficit continues to uh, just a little over an inch and a half. Here's what the radar looks like right now. It is quiet and it should remain that way for at least the next couple of days out here and then we'll look at some partly cloudy skies across East Texas and if you zoom on out, got some showers and thunderstorms firing off just uh, west of the Abilene Sweetwater vicinity north of I-20. That'll be pushing off to the northeast and well north of Dallas and Fort Worth and not any concerns for us here in East Texas, but we still have Hurricane Matthew to talk about. Uh, sustained winds down to 115, but still a major hurricane as it's a Category 3 and it's currently 125 miles uh, south southeast of Nassau, Bahamas. Now, the movement was at earlier today about north, north, to the northwest at about oh, 12 to 14 miles per hour. It has slowed down. Usually when hurricanes slow down, that gives it time to kind of catch up, regroup itself and strengthen. And that forecast track is going to show you why exactly it's going to be doing that. As it pro approaches Florida out here and gets the, into the Gulf Stream, it's going to be hitting some nice warm waters. And then the sustained winds jump up to 130 miles per hour, Category 4, just south of Daytona, just around the Jupiter Beach area, Delray, east of 
Orlando. That's where we're going to be seeing again the uh, greatest concern for some beach erosion, some storm surge anywhere from 10 to 15 feet, especially during the high tide out here and just skirt just to the east of Jacksonville, but still destructive winds. It's going to ride the coast the, all the way up to Somerville, South Carolina, Charleston area, and then eventually as we head towards the weekend, it's going to shift out to sea, which is good news, right? Unfortunately not. As we head towards uh, Monday, it begins pushing to the southeast. And as we head, unfortunately, even more into the week next week, about Wednesday or so, that's when we'll start seeing it dip a little further to the south and then back to the southwest. So Florida looks to take a second hit from Hurricane Matthew. So we're not quite done with that yet. As far as uh, the humor, yeah, the, if you're from Florida, you definitely have it. They're going to be open until the letters fly off of this sign. This is a... Uh, Florida Steakhouse across the eastern parts of Florida, and this was shared uh, by Memphis 10 on Twitter. So thanks for that uh, picture. As far as what we can expect, we are going to be seeing, again, mostly clear skies and partly cloudy skies for the overnight hours. Temperatures should be around 61 degrees to start off. Unfortunately, upper 60s, low 70s. We're going to keep the mild temperatures in the forecast all day on Thursday. A high around 90 degrees for all of us. Most of the rain staying off to our west across I-35 corridor. But we are going to continue seeing the partly cloudy skies. Your seven-day forecast looks like this. Friday, mainly to the west, uh, anywhere from Van Zandt County areas west of there's where I'm forecasting some afternoon showers. Nothing widespread, only a 10% shot. Temperatures remain warm, and then as we head towards Saturday and Sunday, plenty of sunshine for the Red River shootout. Winds are from the north, so we begin to dry out and cool down slightly, but still above average. Columbus Day Monday looks pretty good. We'll have that forecast online for you. Back to you guys. All right, thank you, Alberto. In the meantime, Hurricane Matthew leaving a path of death and destruction in the Caribbean. At least 25 people are dead, and now the storm is gaining strength and aiming for the U.S. <laughs> People up and down the entire East Coast are boarding up windows and cleaning out the shelves of their local grocery stores as they prepare for the strongest storm to threaten the region in more than a decade. This is serious. Having a plan in place could mean the difference between life and death when it comes to a storm of this magnitude. In Florida alone, more than 1.5 million people have been told to leave their homes. Airlines have already canceled 1,200 flights, while Amtrak is suspending service in parts of the southeast tomorrow and Friday. And we are thinking about all of those people there. Absolutely. We're thinking about Keith right now, and he's talking Cowboys. Uh, an injury, I was not aware of this. You're going to surprise me with this one, aren't you? Are yeah, they dealing they, with a big injury? They've got a big injury, and I'm not talking about Des Bryant. Somebody else who is very important to them, well, you know, stay with us, and we'll tell you who it is in just a minute. And the Rangers and Blue Jays get ready to resume their rivalry. We'll look at how we got to this point in this heated back and forth coming up next in sports. ETFinalScore.com is brought to you by Ultra Federal Credit Union, Pelche Chevrolet, Dairy Queen, and Cresta's Trinity Mother Francis Health System. Arlington, Texas and Toronto, Canada are roughly 1,400 miles apart, and it's a good thing because the baseball teams in those cities really seem to dislike one another. But how did we get to this point? Well, it started in the ALDS last year. Decisive game five, game tied at seven, game tied in the seventh, Jose Bautista with a monster home run. The hit wasn't the actual problem. It was the way he watched it and the way he flipped his bat or more of a toss than a bat flip. That's where this rivalry really got started. Uh, but that was just the opening act. Things really got crazy in May of this year. No doubt you remember this. Jose Bautista slides hard into second. The same Jose Bautista who just flipped his bat. Rugnet Odor has had enough, and he makes sure Bautista knows about it, throws a shove, and then the famous hard right to his jaw. Boom. Between those two incidents, there are, is plenty of blood, bad blood between these teams. Odor was asked about it today. He insists it's all ancient history, although you have to wonder if it really is, given how strong the anger has been so far. I mean, I think that's over already. I mean, I'm just, I don't worry about that. I'm just trying to help my team to win the series. I mean, like you say, it's in the past already. I mean, I don't worry about that. I just worry about today and tomorrow. I mean, like I say, we're just trying to play how we play and try to win the series. I mean, I think it's a normal series. I mean, we're just going to try to do the, the same thing that we do with every team, try to play our game and try to win the series. The rivalry will be renewed in the ALDS this year. Game one tomorrow afternoon in Arlington. First pitch is at 338. We will be at that game. So be sure to check Twitter and Facebook throughout the day. We'll take you behind the scenes and show you some of the sights in Arlington. 
The Cowboys are dealing with some serious injury news. Yes, Des Bryant is hurt. Yes, Tony Romo is out. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about kicker Dan Bailey, and I am being completely serious. Bailey told the team his back was hurting before this past week's game. He still kicked in San Francisco, but did miss a 47-yard field goal. He didn't practice today. Jason Garrett said he has no plans to sign another kicker. So what will Dallas do if Bailey can't play? They'll use backup safety Jeff Heath. That's true. Heath did kick in high school. He told the media he made three out of his six practice kicks today. Uh, but that's not really who you want kicking for any prolonged stretch of time. So something to keep an eye on during Sunday's game against Cincinnati. As far as I know, the Kex Texans don't have any kicker drama. They'll be in Minnesota this weekend, and you can watch both those games in one place right here on CBS 19. I'm calling it a Texas doubleheader. Speaking of football, oh, it's been a while since we've talked about Johnny Manziel. Guess what? He's now available to join your favorite team. USA Today Sports is reporting his four-game suspension for violating the substance abuse policy has been lifted. He's been a free agent since the Browns let him go in March, but no one signed to old Johnny football just yet. But now that his suspension is over, we'll have to wait and see if he gets another chance in the NFL. Finally, let's go back to baseball. Last night, there was a strange incident in Toronto involving a fan, a baseball player, and shockingly, alcohol. And we actually learned a lot from this incident. For starters, throwing a can of beer at an opposing player while he's trying to make a catch is not smart. Doing it while there are 10 to 15 cameras in the stadium is even dumber. Now, Toronto police sent out a picture of the beer thrower today, and it did not take long to figure out who he was. 